on this video I am specifically showing how to set a pan liner and pour a pan. I have probably four, five, eight different videos on the different process of building up a curve, of you know prepping a shower uh, to get ready for tile, including setting the drain and all this stuff. All of this prep I did not do. The only thing I did is I put in these scab pieces. Uh, the homeowner wants to go ahead and do his own job and do his own tile and all that stuff. So all I'm here for is to put the pan in. Um, going forward, since again, you know, I didn't do all this prep, all I can show from this point forward is this process of putting the liner in the pan in. If you want to go find out how to put an OD drain in, I have a video somewhere. I have a whole bunch of videos. You can go find that, how to install an OD drain for your shower. Um, the whole process of doing the prep. I have a couple videos on how to build a curb. It's pretty self-evident. There's three 2x4s. They get nailed down. A lot, a lot of nails going there, first, second, and third one. Um, so you can go and watch that video, how to do um, a curb. So there's, I guess what I'm getting at is this is relatively a short video. Specifically, as I said at the beginning, only how to put a pan liner in and pour the pan. And I have little different ways of doing things. Um, this pan liner is actually a 4x5, I think. It's a 4x5 piece that Home Depot sells. Um, pre-cut 4x5 and I have basically a 3x3 shower so what you're going to end up seeing is a whole lot of excess pan liner probably going up the wall about this high um, so it's a lot of pan liner for a small shower however having said that there's no harm no foul if you're at the very minimum this is about seven inches you have a 2x6 going on and then you got of course 2x4 at the bottom there so you got about six inches of room if you go up about seven you're good so a pan liner at the very minimum should be about six, maybe seven inches um, at the very least. And anything beyond that is, is gravy. Um, there's no point in cutting the excess off. I used to years ago, and I don't do it anymore because there's, there's no point. Um, all it can do is help you and not hinder you. So I'm going to go ahead with, with setting this liner in and screwing it in to these 2x4s and all that stuff. And I will, I will come back when that is finished, and I will show you basically... I, it's very difficult for me to tape my work like a lot of other tilers have videos on showing how they do things and I, I rarely if ever do that um, because you know it's hard for me to, to, to do that and then video at the same time but I will actually explain what I've done after I've done it. Alright so I have uh, only put the pan liner in you see it goes up quite a big distance this is probably a good 13 14 inches up the wall and that is totally not needed but you know if you end up with the excess it doesn't do you any harm either so the 12 14 inches or all the, all three ways around and of course I always wrap the curb with the pan liner also there is a lot of people uh, I've gotten comments before on other videos which is kind of funny because then I go look at their videos and they don't have any that get on to me about having cut this pan liner to in order to wrap the curb they kind of feel like there there should be something there against this wall although this part of the wall is never going to see water because ultimately you'll have a shower door here so you just have this little excess part and the excess part over here of maybe an inch inch and a half of room where there's no pan liner but let me explain that it's very very simple there is hardy board that this customer is actually going to put on here. Hardy board is, is very hard, tough material. And that is going to push up against this wall and push up against this. And, and it's going to be screwed down and, and, you know, it's going to be very tough, right? So on top of that, there's going to be red guard. The customer already bought red guard. So once he puts the hardy backer on all three walls, all the way up to the edge, hello, all the way up to the edge of this door frame or this door jam right here. Once he puts a hardy backer up there and then puts the hardy backer on the inside and the outside and the top of the curb, then it's all one contiguous piece, more or less, of hardy backer because he's going to, you know, tape the edges and do what he's going to do and then he's going to red guard the whole thing. So the fact that this is exposed right now is absolutely 100% irrelevant. If there is a way that you want to come in here retroactively, they have little corner pieces of this material, the PVC material, and if you, it makes you feel better about putting a corner piece in here. It's a little rounded piece, and it's rounded here, and you glue it on, and you know, that, and if that makes you feel better, then by all means, go ahead and do that. I don't do it because of what I just explained already about putting the, the backer board up and red guarding and all that stuff. It, it negates the fact that this is exposed. 
So anyway, the point being is that the pan liner is put in here. It's kind of a cold day outside. You can see there's kind of wrinkles in the liner, and usually I like to, to have it more supple and, and be able to manipulate a little better so these wrinkles don't really matter. But the next step is going to be, uh, oh, let me explain. So you can see in the back here, in the back corner, is how the pan liner gets folded on itself in the corner, and I always do the fold in the same direction. So if I'm using the back wall, excuse me, then... The, the folds get done on both the back wall side. If I'm doing the front, again, the folds end up there so that it's, it's even. And I get asked the question a lot, well, doesn't that cause a bump out of your wall board? Yes, it does slightly. And the harder the board is, like Hardy Backer, the less bump out you're going to experience. But it really doesn't matter because in the long run, when I do tile anyway, I manipulate my thin set. So if I have a little bit more thin set that I have to put in this middle part as opposed to the corner parts, then so be it. The bump out is irrelevant to me. There's another way to do it in between the two boards right there where the left and right come together. You can actually get a sawzall blade and you can notch out and you can stick that excess pan liner inside there and inside there so that you don't have the bump out at all. Um, I wasn't able to do that. In this case, I'd already notched out probably a good portion, about two or three inches of that in the back, and that was already naturally notched out. But I couldn't do that because of the the depth of the shower pan, the height of the shower pan wouldn't allow me. I would have had to come up with my sawzall retroactively again and then start cutting that out and wasting more time and all that stuff. But that is a, a different way. If you don't want to fold these, then that's fine. Um, so again, and then of course, hello, there's a dozen different ways. If this bumps out, say an eighth of an inch, uh, right, then you can put some eighth of an inch shims right on this part and that part and make up the difference and it really doesn't matter. But I don't get too focused on on that type of stuff. I'm just trying to make this as easy peasy as possible and putting the pan liner in took all of you know five minutes so I'm putting a screw in on every stud and that's all you really need. Every stud gets a screw higher up the possible the better um, and and then of course you know when you wrap it the screws go at the bottom here. So the next ne next step in this process is going to be the actual drain as you saw that already there's a bottom drain flange that was on the floor this is the top drain flange. Top drain flange will hold the drain flange down so when the barrel goes in, you know, it's stable and, and, and anchored. There's four bolts that go into these four holes here. And the process is really easy. I'm gonna show you how I do it. There's different ways to do it. Um, my method has always worked for me and that's, that's what you're gonna see. All right, so this process, as I said already, is pretty easy. When you feel around this, this opening here, this hole for your drain, you're gonna know from left to right. Actually, most days I can actually see the indentation of this hole. And all I simply do is take a razor knife, and I don't go up to the edge of where I can feel. I go up almost to the edge. Let me feel it again. So I go almost to the edge, maybe about three quarters of an inch off of the edge, and I just bring a cut all the way down again about three quarters almost to the edge here about three quarters of an inch and then I do the same thing on the other side so I'm going to make a little perforation here and then I'm going to make a perforation on this side almost up to the edge right so now I have my little X made once I have my X made I can feel up under here I can feel where the holes are at you're going to see other videos where um, the person has actually put the bolts in prior to putting the pan on and then they search around for the head of the bolt and then they make a little X on, on the pan liner. They make a little X and then push the head of the bolt through. And it's always kind of amazed me that they do that because it stretches out your pan liner. This part of the bolt is not as thick as the head of the bolt, so why would you want to stretch out your pan liner? So the way I've always done it is I reach up under there with my finger and I can actually feel where the hole is at. Once I feel where the hole is at, I make a very, very small X, same as I just got through doing on the drain part. Very small one. I want it to be a very snug fit. And then I push my bolt through that X. And if it's really tough to push through, the better, which this one definitely was. And then I can actually get it into the hole at the bottom and, and screw it down. You don't screw down all the way and then push the excess pan liner around the, the shaft of the bolt. And then you just repeat that process with the remaining three bolts. Again, reaching under there, I can feel where the hole is at. Definitively, now you have to be careful doing this because you don't want to perforate this pan any more than you need to. These perforations end up being four. There's one in the middle and then for the four bolts. Nothing more. 
And if you mess this up, if you mess this process up, you're going to have to start all over again. Anyway, so there's where my hole is at. I can clearly feel where it's at. I make my small perforation and I push the shaft of the bolt right through. And again, very, very tight fit, which is why I don't like doing it the other way that I explained pushing the pan liner over the head. That makes no sense to me. So again, this is my way of doing it. You'll find other ways. And I'm not saying they're right or wrong, I'm just saying it doesn't make any sense to me to do it in reverse. Once you have all four of your bolts snugly fit in there, the top flange gets pushed down and turned. And if it's too tight the way it is now, then you just back up your bolts a little bit. And that's it. So the process of tightening down these bolts, you don't do one all the way tight. You do it kind of where it's snug. Then you, then you go on to the next one where it's kind of snug. Then the next one where it's kind of snug. You don't want to tighten one bolt all the way down at the first shot. So. And then the final step in the process is actually putting the drain barrel down into the drain itself. And of course it's threaded, but don't misthread it. These things fit relatively loose and it's very easy to misthread this. So what you want to do, the easiest way is to turn it to the left, right? Righty tightsy, but you're going to turn it to the left loosey until you hear a click. That's it, right there. Then you can turn it right. Once you hear that click, you know you're threaded correctly. And then you just turn it down to the point where you want it. Now typically I'm going up about an inch, inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half. It depends on how wide the shower is. In this case, because it's kind of a short shower, I'm probably going to screw it down all the way to about three quarters, maybe one inch down before it hits the bottom. And then my mortar on the, on the perimeter on the sides will be about two and a half inches, maybe three, going all the way around the perimeter, sloped down to where the drain is at. So one other thing about these drains, uh, you see I have my, my inch, inch and a half going on right here. So that's about where I want it. There are two screws. When you buy these drains from Home Depot specifically, some drain co covers are not like this. They're snap-ins. I don't like the snap-ins because they never stay on. So there's two screws that hold, that hold this drain cover on here. And a lot of people, especially DIYers, don't realize, wow, you know, they're you want things to line up. I'm very symmetrical thinking. So either I want my screws facing this way or I want them facing that way, one or the other. But I just don't like it willy-nilly like that. So if you have a shower you're doing, kind of pay attention to that. It, it's not important. It doesn't help the function of it. But in the end, when you have your nice tile and all that stuff done and then you notice the screws are discombobulated, it, it bothers me. So it might bother you too. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so mixing your thin, I'm sorry, mixing your mortar. This is about the consistency I let my mortar. I have probably three and a half to four gallons of water for two bags. And that's about it. I don't like it any runnier than this, and I don't like it any thicker. You're going to see videos out there that, that they do what's called a dry pack. So probably 
if I use three gallons on this, which is about right, they're probably using two. And it's a very, very tough, hard consistency. So uh, what a dry pack is, you have to put it down here and you have to manipulate it and you're going to see some of those videos online. And they take a lot, a lot of time to screed out all of this mortar into a shower pan and then they're using a masonry trowel and they're tapping it down and they're, oh my God. I've seen, I've seen videos where I'm looking at them doing a shower pan for 40 minutes, an hour, just trying to tap down all the dry pack. I don't really believe in that. And then at the end of the video, they're spraying it with water because it's so dry that the consistency of your mortar trying to get it to be what it's supposed to be, which is this. Um, back in, back a long time ago, <laughs> I'm not gonna say when, back a long time ago when I was much younger, I was a mason tender and I had to mix this type of mortar for the mason that I worked for. He was, he, he did both brick and block type of work. And there's no way with dry pack that he could ever work. This is about the consistency he worked with. So when he's setting his block and his brick, this is, this is what he needed in order to make it happen to where he could, he could use it. And also when it dries, that everything, that there's no dry spots at all whatsoever, that it's wet. And when it dries, it's hard as a rock. If you have a brick facade on your house, go look. That is hard as a rock. So this stuff will definitely dry despite the fact that it's wet. Doing a dry pack um, is, is first of all a lot of work and I think counterproductive, my opinion, because there are so many dry areas in that since you're only spraying the surface that I would just be very wary to do a dry pack. If you have air, you know, even though you're packing it down, pack it, it's taken a long time to pack that down. I'm gonna show the process how I do it in just a few minutes, but I'm letting you know Again, this is my method. I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm saying this is the way I do it and it's gonna make your job much easier than doing dry packing. So the next step in the process, once your, your uh, mud bed, your mortar mix as it were, um, is actually in your pan, I had to unscrew the barrel of my drain. I think I got about two inches. I'm gonna say about two inches higher than um, what I originally anticipated. The reason why is because on the inside of this curb, you want a good bite. You want enough material here. You want your uh, both your backer board and your tile to have enough girth, to have enough room here to actually matter. I mean, you don't want a little sliver piece on the inside of your curb. So I'm trying to get about two inches, at least an inch and a half to two inches of material on the inside of my curb. And in order to do that, I have such a very quick slope. This drain isn't centered. And so I have a very quick slope to come down. And in order to do that, I had to unscrew my drain barrel to get about two more inches up. And then therefore, um, I had three bags that I poured in here or that I mixed up and I set them in here and realized that I had way too much mortar. So I had to dump probably another half a bag. So this is total of about two and a half bags is my point. Um, so what I do is I, I, I put gloves on, rubber gloves, and I just spread all my, my mortar out to where I want it. You know, like this is, this is very preliminary, but I'm, I'm just getting my, my mortar. And I have a blade, a 12 inch blade, and I just kind of move my mortar to areas that I need it. I know I need it in this corner, so I just kind of move it over there. And again, this is very preliminary. All I'm trying to do is get it basically where I'm gonna be needing it. And at the same time I have my gloves on, I'm packing my mortar inside up, up against my drain barrel. Um, again, getting back to other videos, I've seen people when they pour their mortar that they unscrew and screw back in and unscrew and screw back in so that they have a loose drain so that retroactively after all this is dried, if they realize, oops, I made a mistake, I need to unscrew my drain to get more height or vice versa, that they can do that. I never am about doing that. I want my mortar to dry very stiff up against my drain. I don't want that looseness because if it's loose now, when you put your tile in, it's also gonna be loose. I don't like that idea at all. There's a couple of videos I've watched recently like that. Don't do that. Pack your mortar, get some gloves on, and, and push it up against that drain. And then when you tap everything down, make sure that, that you don't miss this area also. I mean, you don't want any air or excess voids or anything like that going on. So I just kind of play around in this mud for a while until I'm pretty confident I have most of my mud where I want it. And then I have a hoe that I use to tap everything down. And um, it doesn't really matter 
if you use a hoe or if you use a two by four or whatever tool you want to use, it doesn't matter. But the whole idea is you want to pack everything down um, so you have no voids. And that's the point. I just prefer the hoe because I have it all already when I'm mixing this stuff up. So I've just gotten used to the, using that tool. So I'm, I'm pretty much, for the most part, where I want things. Um, so then I just go ahead and grab my hoe and I just start at one end, not missing a spot, and tap everything down. A good amount of pressure. Get to the back, work my way forward again. Very tedious, boring process that I'm sure you don't want to watch, but again, I can hear the whole house shake. That's what you want. No voids whatsoever. I'm going to show you how to get up around that drain in a minute here. Okay, so getting up around the drain is relatively easy. Same thing with the hoe, I mean, it doesn't matter. Again, a little sh short piece of two by four or whatever. You just wanna kind of push it up under the drain lip and push everything down that's underneath it. Sometimes it's easier to do with my blade than it is with this. But the point is, again, no voids. You don't want any voids in here whatsoever. So any which way you do it, doesn't really matter. Like I said, this is the easiest way. I'll go over this probably about three times. I'll, I'll do this, you know, the direction that I started at like this, and then I'll switch it and I'll do it this direction, and then I'll switch it again after I've gone back and forth that direction, and then I'll do it again. So I'm not gonna bore you with all that, but you know, I got about five more minutes of tapping this down, and then I will show you how to slope it down to the drain. All right, as I was explaining earlier, using a two by four works the same way. You know, if you want to do it that way, no issues there. You know, just make sure again you get up around the drain. Um, so moving forward to get this all right, these drains typically have a little play in them. So I take a little torpedo level and I make sure it's level. Right now my bubble is perfect. So the bubble thing is important when you start setting your tile. I can actually see from the top. The bubble thing is important when you start setting your tile. Look at that. So both left and right and front and back, my bubble is perfect. So I don't want to mess with my drain anymore. I just want to start spreading out this mortar and, you know, getting it to the slope that I need. So for that, my, my tool of choice is this. There's other videos out there again, you know, not to push other people's videos, but, you know, they'll, they'll set way before they pour their bed, they'll set a two by four up there and they'll draw a line with magic marker and they know that that's where their mortar stops. And so once they have their mortar line all the way around, that's one way to do it. Then they can just slope it down to the drain, putting a level on it once in a while. That's, that's one way to do it. I do it by sight and by blade. And again, there's no right or wrong way. It's whatever way works best for you. I've just been doing this by default for years. And once again, I cannot do what I'm doing now with a dry pack. It will not work for me. When you do a dry pack, you're going to spend a lot, a lot of time trying to get that very, very dry, stiff mortar to do what you want it to do.
Okay, so now that that part is done, uh, as I said, I almost always, almost always do this by hand, and I get it to the slope that I want, which is about where it's at now. And you know, I have I have different multiple levels. I have the torpedo level that you just saw. Where's that? Right there. I have a two foot level. I have a brand new, spanking new two foot level. And normally, almost always, my eyeball is so level that I don't even almost need to double check this. But I'm going to anyway for the benefit of you. And so I'm off slightly. If I put a little bit more mortar on that side, not even a whole lot, then I'll be level. On this side, again, a little bit more mortar on that corner side will get me level. And same thing, a little bit more up there. So now all I have to do is manipulate my mortar one more time. You know, push a little bit more up there, push a little more there, and a little more in that corner, and I should be okay. I have a smaller level. It's a it's a red one that um, you know, what is this? I think it's 18 inch level, and this one is very dirty. I don't know if you can see the bubble, but the bubble is definitely okay. There it is. The bubble is definitely look at look at this the pitch that I have. That's perfect. So once my bubble is center, I can actually see that I have a decent pitch on my right side as well as my left side. And so lifting that up a little bit to get the bubble center, there you see my pitch. And so that's exactly what I want right there with my bubble center. Um, so my pitch is perfect from the back. I just have to, or from the front rather, I just have to get my pitch perfect to the back and I'll be good. And then I have my, my as I said, my inch and a half, two inches of room here um, that I need for my inside part. So after about 15, eh, roughly 15, 20 minutes of manipulating all my mortar where I need it, I found out I had a little excess and the excess mortar was causing me a little angst because I would, I would be level in some areas and not quite in others. And so pretty much now I have it down pat. The front part of it, bubble is right on. My left side, bubble is right on. My right side, bubble is right on. And when I say right on, I mean the level should be flat to the ground. There shouldn't be any dips or there shouldn't be any humps. Although the humps really don't matter. The next day you can you can take that same blade that I showed you earlier and, and kind of scrape off if there's any humps. But the idea is um, you should be level. Whoop, come on, camera. You should be level on all four sides. Then these marks right here is my level going down toward the drain. See, again, you don't want any pumps or dips or anything like that and you want your bubble to be off you want it to be pretty profoundly off the way it is right now um, and then you do it the same way on this side again you know the bubble will be off and I have my short level around here somewhere and I've already done this this is really dirty dirty level I got to get a new one but this short level goes on these short ends and the bubble is off on that too you can't see it but it's definitely sloped down toward the drain and then the, the other measurement was on that side and now you know you're set now you know at this point all you have to do is put a fan on this overnight and you can actually step on it the next day um, the, the particular bag of mortar that I'm using if you saw it in the very beginning of the video is a Home Depot product it is the yellow bag with the green stripe don't get the yellow bag with the red stripe um, the one with the red stripe will actually dry the next day solid. There's no way you can get a blade in there and scrape off any inconsistency. If, if you got some high spots or something, that, that, that yellow bag with the red stripe that Home Depot sells, that will be like hard as concrete. So don't get that bag. Get the yellow bag with the green stripe. And, and as I said, tomorrow, if you have any high spots or whatever, you can manipulate that. But again, you can manipulate your thin set when you're setting your tile too. So, you, so even if you mess this up slightly, there's still some corrections you can make. Um, I'm, I'm probably about a quarter inch, maybe about three eighths of an inch off of the edge of the drain here. And that is for both the thin set and the tile to butt up against there. And so make sure that if you're gonna do one of these um, drains or, or shower pans yourself, that you leave enough room for your tile. I usually try and make it a little bit higher than possible because I like my tile to set 
slightly above the drain cap and then I taper off the little edges of each tile that goes around so I have positive water flow that goes down rather than have my tile straight flush. Um, that's just the way I do it, but you know, do it your own way. Um, and so it's that easy. That's, that's how you put a pan liner in and, and how you pour the pan. Um, it's not a literal sense pouring the pan, as you saw. Um, it's, it's relatively easy. Um, I do it by eyeball. If you want to cheat, if you want to try other methods, as I said, with the 2x4s and the magic marker and all that other stuff, you can do that too. Or you can buy Pitch Perfect. It's a product that has plastic rails. I think there are six of them, and, and they're attached to the drain. And then you just pour your mortar up to the top of those rails, and it makes it really easy. It's a no-brainer. So it's a great DIY product. I'm not endorsing and I don't get paid by them, but it's called Pitch Perfect and it will give you the pitch that you need automatically without doing all this stuff that I do. And so there you go. Hope that helps you. you gotta have some